Herkese merhaba. Bu hafta çok değerli, çok özel bir konukla çok değerli ve çok özel bir sohbet yapacağım. Kanser konusunda sadece Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde değil ama dünyanın her yerinde çok iyi bilinen, biraz aykırı ve kanser konusunda oldukça yeni fikirleri olan çok önemli bir bilim insanı ile beraberim, çok sevgili bir dostumla beraberim. Hi Azra, welcome to Turkey again. It will it is a great pleasure for us to see you again after the pandemic in Turkey. Uh, I hope that everything is fine and you are okay. Uh, I would like to do a very special, very private interview and I would like to ask you a lot of questions about you, your career, uh, your ideas about the cancer uh, and of course the new book which is uh, The First Cell. Merhaba. <laughs> You are one of the most well-known scientists in uh, in the world. Can you briefly tell me that how can you got it? I don't agree with that assessment at all. Uh, I'm a struggling scientist like all other scientists are because uh, success must continually be won and is never finally achieved. We must never look at the end of the road because we are always at the beginning of a new one. So I must say that I am a student of science. Art is I, where an, an artist can stand and paint like Van Gogh did Starry Nights by himself. But science is we, so it is a collective effort. And when did you decide to be a physician? You will not believe that uh, at, uh, as a teenager, I read a book. Uh, I used to read a lot and I read a book about cancer where two things to this day have fascinated me. The first was that in our bodies, we give birth to a new life form which can live forever. It looks like to be a god. Uh, to be, a, yes, a different species. And it can live forever. So it occurred to me that if we can unlock the secret of cancer, we unlock the secret of aging and immortality. We could live forever too. Second thing was, I read the book in which it said that the body is like a state, a country. And its citizens are cells. And citizens have to follow rules. And one of the rules is that liver cells must stay in the liver, ovarian cells in the ovaries. Only in cancer, they can walk out. Yes. <laughs> and liver cells can end up landing in the bone marrow and breast cancer cells land up in the brain. Why? How? So these two things fascinated me. But I was growing up in Pakistan, Mustafa. And at that time, the only way to pursue science was to go into medical school. So that is why I joined medical school. When you were a kid, what was your biggest dream? At that time when I started, my dream was to cure cancer. But once I saw the first patient with cancer, my dream became to reduce the suffering of humanity. That's how it changed. And the change is something like going from curiosity where you want to find answers because you are interested in uh, finding a good explanation for why this is happening, to wonder. Wonder is very different than curiosity. Wonder is when you think you know everything about something and suddenly another piece comes along and it throws you all you knew uh, into on its head. So seeing patients did that to me. That seeing how people suffer with this disease uh, changed my uh, my goal from curiosity to wonder, from intellectual uh, interest to an emotional investment. As you know that I am one of uh, your fun from the uh, scientific point of view, from the intelligent point of view, and I really uh, wonder uh, what would you have done differently if in the past, if you had the mind right now You know, I 
am one of those few people I know who right from the beginning has been completely invested in only one mission. Find cancer early, prevent it, and study human tissues to do it. So what would I do differently? Um, I think the only thing I would do differently is try to uh, make policy changes, try to force policy changes sooner than I did. But ap apart from that, in terms of my career, no, I would, you know, you need investment of years to learn about how to pr take care of patients properly. I believe that to be an intelligent is very critical for being a good physician, I think. And you are a real intelligent woman. I know you uh, know a lot of things about history, about uh, literature, I know. And now you focused on a new book, The, the First Cell, it, which is very well-known uh, book. And uh, you, uh, this book was on uh, Amazon top uh, seller writing. Uh, and uh, translated into nine different languages, and now in Turkey we have also, fortunately. And why do you need to write that kind of book uh, for the uh, ordinary people? If we weren't doing this interview, I would turn the question and ask you, why do you think I needed to do it? Do you want uh, to I know, I know your question, because you are not uh, satisfied the uh, developing of uh, progressing of the uh, cancer research and uh, the cure rate is so low and you asked me this question for a few years ago the same question you remember for your youtube channel and i uh, ask right now for my uh, youtube channel the, we we are totally agree that we need to do more and we are totally agree that we really need to change our policy uh, in the era of cancer. So, but you have some uh, different ideas. I mean, it's uh, different than the uh, classical, the routine uh, uh, approach, you know. Uh, you try to collect the sample of the patients. You try to find the first cell and you believe that the early stage doesn't mean early stage. It's, it's late uh, and uh, I really would like to hear uh, that what is your motivation? You have hit the nail on the head by saying that it's always the patients who have moved me to do things. And uh, even writing the book is an utter frustration of how slowly the pace of progress in treating advanced cancers is so bad that our death rate from cancer today in 2022 in America is the same that it was in 1930. How is that possible? Yes, if we find cancer early, we can cure 70% of cancers with surgery, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, occasionally immune or targeted therapies, but very occasional. Mostly, the mainstay of treatment remains what I call the slash, poison and burn. And with that, we are curing 70% of the patients. So my first question is always, why are we still using these horrible treatments? Where has a trillion dollars in research gone? And the second question is, anyone who presents with advanced cancers is at risk of dying quickly because we are not offering them effective treatments, but we keep treating them. You see, that's the problem. It's not that we say, okay, you have stage four pancreatic cancer, you have 16 months to live and leave you alone. No, in those 16 months, we will give you so many treatments that will ruin you financially and cause all kinds of physical toxicities and not improve your survival by more than a couple of months. Yes. These are my problems. Honestly, I believe that the survival is improved uh, day by day, but not enough, you said. Yes, we need to do more. Yes, absolutely, I am totally agree with you, but that doesn't mean that 
uh, nowadays the therapy that we use in cancer patient is not uh, uh, correct. We try to do our correct right now, but in future we really need to prevent uh, the patient from the cancer. Look, if I had stage 4 pancreatic cancer today, I would take all these treatments myself yes. because there is nothing else. I What do I have to lose? So yes, I agree with you, but my questions are why is that the best we can do? We should be able to do better. So where, well, then it leads me to ask the question, why aren't we getting there faster? And it turns out that the two main reasons are because one, we focus on trying to kill the last cancer cell, whereas we should be focusing on the first. And the second is, we create, we take a mouse, we kill its immune system completely, then we put some cancer cells in it, cancer grows, now we treat it with some drug, and if the cancer disappears, we claim, oh, the mouse is cured of cancer, now we bring that drug to the bedside, and it fails. 95% of experimental drugs today, 95% fail completely. And the 5% that succeed should have failed because they are improving survival by a median of 2.1 months. This is my problem. This is why I wrote the book. Why do you think that FDA approved, why F FDA approved this kind of uh, therapies? For example, as you said that uh, 2.1 months means nothing when you think the whole life of a human being means nothing. So what is the rationale to improve this kind of drugs? Two answers to your question. One is that 2.1 months can mean something for one person. Even one extra day can mean something. But what we should remember is that to get uh, appro the improvement of 2.1 months for 20% patients, 80% had to suffer every side effect with no benefit, not even 2.1 months. Why are we putting 80 patients for the sake of 20 for two months? This is number one. Why is the FDA doing this? There are many reasons for it, uh, Mustafa. But I have to say one of the main ones is patients themselves. They have advocacy groups who keep going to the FDA and saying, you're not approving any drugs for cancer. You have approved a drug for such diabetes and you did. Why not? Ca there is so much pressure on the FDA from uh, societies, organizations. Like I said, there are multiple reasons. One of the main ones is the patients. I know that many people think it's industry. But look, industries stated objective is to make money for their shareholders. So they don't hide their aim at all. Yeah. Look, we are in it for the money. We will come in. But then the institutions in America give research money to an investigator like me to do research in my lab at Columbia University. And let's say I, ad I identify an important target against which a drug can be built. Now the problem is I have to collaborate with an industry because the kind of money needed to bring this to the bedside is hundreds of millions of dollars and no, ins uh, no cancer institute is going to give me hundreds of millions of dollars. Only industry can invest it because they expect to make billions from it. You see, so it's the system. The way it has evolved is that we as researchers in academic institutions like Columbia and Harvard and Yale, we are all dependent on industry in the end. And what did your colleagues uh, think about your idea uh, at the beginning of your adventure? And right now, what do you think? Again, very important questions and there is a philosophical angle also. But uh, my entire life uh, has been devoted to finding cancer in before it declares itself, meaning trying to find it so early in people who are at risk of getting it. And my second thing has always been study human tissue, not animal tissue, to find the early cancer. To do that, I started in 1984 by focusing on not just leukemia patients, but people at risk of getting leukemia. That is called myelodysplastic syndromes. 
since 1984 i have only studied patients with mds and followed them as they develop leukemia and at every step i saved their blood and marrow samples today i have 60000 samples in my tissue repository obtained from thousands of patients longitudinally so we have all this tissue bank now and now that the technology is available we are i am starting to collaborate with large institutions like industrial in inst- uh, pharmaceutical companies companies invested in doing biotechnology to cooperate with them to study these samples to trace back to the first cell and so because of my uh track record that i have never changed my mind from early detection and studying human tissue and having a tissue repository it's very hard for my colleagues to criticize me because number 1 i am an oncologist who sees 30 to 40 cancer patients every week in my clinic even today number 2 i supervise a cancer research lab and number 3 i am a cancer widow My own husband who was head of the cancer center at the university in Chicago died of a painful 5 year long battle with leukemia the very disease he had dedicated his life to cure so what angle of cancer is anyone going to lecture me about and uh, i know that the public supports including the celebrities and uh, famous uh, politicians even the president of us uh try to support you uh and you uh try to uh take his support not only from uh, us but also for, for example from turkey and the other countries and you try to develop your project in all over the world and you believe that the cost of the uh, new therapies including car t cell is very uh, expensive and helps only a few people in all over the world so uh, we also need to do something again in this era what do you think about that i couldn't agree more with you mustafa that <clears throat> like i said earlier science is not an enterprise that can be conducted by an individual it has to be a collective effort at the level of uh, community society at the level of the public at the level of uh, universality including um people all over the world we all have to uh, come up with solutions that are applicable everywhere and so with this in mind i first decided that if i'm going to go out and uh, criticize what is the way things are being done now why not start at my own institution columbia university so i went and spoke to the dean the head of medicine the head of the cancer center the head of the divisions of hematology oncology and i began by giving grand rounds at columbia university laying out my entire thesis and all my criticism and afterwards uh, dr gary schwartz who's the chief of hematology oncology and my immediate boss came to me with tears in his eyes mustafa and he said azra you used to be our scientific leader now you are our spiritual leader also yes so you see the whole of columbia's leadership is behind me because i said to them if you don't support me in what i'm saying then how can i expect support from outsiders point out what i'm saying wrong or support me and this is how i got the strength to now go out and build a national oncology think tank including institutions like Columbia University, Harvard, Hopkins, University of Chicago, MD Anderson, Northwest. I mean, these are some of the most famous institutions in the country. Leaders of all of them came together to be part of the think tank. And then I brought industry in it, academia and industry. You know that it's the critical one of the critical point is to find the uh, money, you know. It's so so critical. and hopefully you can find it in us us the reason i am in the united states since i graduated medical school is just this it's the most affluent country in the world it has too much money it's not lack of money it's how money is being spent that's 
got to change. Is it is not also enough, you know, that you uh, gave me an example during our private conversation about the shoes uh, spending money and uh, the uh, cancer uh, funding money. Uh, how many million dollars? Does the American spend for the shoes in a year? <laughs> I think 320 billion. But then shoes are worn by everybody. Cancer is only for 1 million, uh, 1.8 million yes. new cancers. We, uh, you need, we need to force them to uh, take more uh, funds, you know, to do a more uh, research. And, and the distribution of the fund is also very critical. That is more critical than the amount of money. Uh, there is a there is a lot of money in biotechnology also, Mustafa. That if uh, you develop something new, there are venture capitalists and investors ready to give you hundreds of millions of dollars to support your project because then they expect to make money from it. So I think the capitalist system really helps research, in fact, especially in a country like America. I have never complained about lack of money. Let me give you one example. To maintain a tissue repository like I have costs about a million dollars a year. There is no grant available in America that will support this kind of thing. This is why I'm unique, that I have a loan as a single individual, the largest tissue repository in the world in this MDS and AML. But who supports this? My patients and celebrities. So what I do is patients are always trying to give me money or their families after patients die, then their families and friends want to write checks in memory of the patient. And you collect how many dollars? A million dollars a year just from that because that supports the tissue repository. And then, you know, my first fundraiser, I do fundraisers to raise money for the tissue repository, not just to keep the samples, but to study the samples. And for example, that uh, first fundraiser was held in the home of uh, Deborah and Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman is a huge movie star, Wolverine fame. They are big supporters of cancer research, big supporters of me. Every year when I have held the ben the fundraising benefit gala, Hugh and Deborah Jackman are the hosts for it. And who who has uh, who performs in the gala held at Lincoln Center in New York City? Uh, people like James Taylor, Paul Simon, Chaka Khan, Diana Reeves. I mean, incredible artists all giving their time free for me because they want to help. So I'm telling you that money can be raised from all kinds of sources. One has to be resourceful. You have a very close contact with uh, Biden and uh, Clinton. Yes. And they did they support you? They always support uh, ventures like this. When I was, uh, after I created the think tank, the conclusion of the think tank after 17 uh, meetings was that we need to find cancer before stage one. Stage one is already too late because it requires chemotherapy, surgery or radiation therapy. To prevent patients from getting these painful treatments, we need to find cancer at the first cell level. This is the conclusion of the think tank now, all those institutions and academia industry together. How to find it? We decided to make a tissue bank of people at risk of getting cancer. And to support this tissue bank, I needed something like $20 million. Wow. So I called up the director of the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Doug Louie, who was delightful. He was he had several one-to-one -one meetings with me. He was so impressed, so happy with all that I had done. Um, and then he wanted to support us, went back to the leadership committee of, N of the National Cancer Institute, and they were very supportive. But they said, ask Dr. Raza to apply for these grants. Uh -huh. So I said to myself, if I apply for these grants and try to fight for this money, it will take me 10 years. I don't have the time. So I just went and raised the 20 million from other sources <laughs> very quickly. You know, the government moves move very slowly. I don't have that time. But I must say they're very supportive.
Okay, and uh, I know that you have some problems with the animal studies. You know, you know. Uh, what do you think about the mouse uh, animal studies, especially the mouse studies, mouse models? Do you believe uh, that kind of uh, studies uh, can help uh, to find the first cell in human beings? No, the short answer is absolutely no. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, uh, that. Uh, John Brockman is a is a very great intellectual, but also a literary agent in New York City. And Brockman was uh, uh, very good friends with Andy Warhol, who's a great American artist. Um, and John Brockman gives an annual question to about 150 intellectuals around the world. And one year, I'm one of them. One year, his question was, what scientific idea do you think should be retired? And my answer was, the real elephant in the room is the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the mouse has to go. And you know, out of 150 intellectuals, which included people like uh, Richard Dawkins, Steven Pinker, Daniel Dennett, uh, Carlo Rovelli, I mean, all kinds of famous people, mine was the number one answer, picked up by newspapers. <laughs> because what I said was so shocking to everybody. Now, I want to take away, uh, Mustafa, one confusion here. I'm not against using mouse models to study biology. All I'm saying is mouse models do not serve as a good system in which to develop treatments for humans with cancer. I don't know about other diseases. I can only speak for cancer. What we do is we take a mouse, we kill its immune system, we put some cancer cells from humans into it. It's They start to grow in the mouse because its immune system is destroyed. So these cells grow. Now we kill these cells with some therapy. And if the mouse is, uh, shows disappearance of the cells, we say, ah, cure, and try to bring that to the bedside of humans. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for 50 years. 95% clinical trials are failing today because of this mouse model system. This is the system I'm against. I'm saying, so people tell me, oh, well, but you can't experiment on humans. First of all, you're always experimenting on humans. What are phase one trials? Why should it give you any level of confidence that in the mouse it did not have toxicity, so in humans it won't? Of course it can have toxicity. And we do create horrible toxicity in stage one. Uh, so people tell me you can't experiment in humans. My answer is then ask different questions. The question you should ask in humans is what is the earliest marker of stress we can pick from two drops of blood or a little bit of saliva or five cc's of urine? Why not ask that question? What are the first cells that we can detect in the blood of a cancer patient? So the nature of questions addressed in humans has to be different than the nature of questions being addressed in mice. That's all. You're, you're absolutely right. And do you know that I feel very lucky uh, to be your friends and to meet you. And it was really a very amazing interview. And I really would like to do again, maybe next year, and I really would like to see you again more frequently in Turkey. Uh, what message would you like to give the Turkish people and the cancer patient in Turkey? First of all, thank you for being my friend. I feel equally honored to be called a friend by you. Thank you. I respect you deeply as a clinician. You are an amazing oncologist and... Everybody, if I have cancer, send me to Mustafa. I know he will take the best care of me. Uh, my message to Turkey is, first of all, I love Turkey. I love coming here. I come here every year and I, thanks to Mustafa and my friend Burhan, uh, but also because I have family here in Turkey. Please introduce me to your health minister and to the government officials people of Turkey because I would like to sit face to face with them yes. and tell them that there is a lot you can do 
to help third world countries like mine, like Pakistan, where I come from, where people are not as rich as they are in Turkey. But Turkey has the resources. They just have to be directed properly towards early detection. Turkey does not have to follow blindly in the footsteps of America. No, you can take a stand. You can take an early initiative. And I recommend making Mustafa Chetinev the head of such an initiative. And we will collaborate completely and fully. Let's collect a tissue bank of cancer survivors in Turkey. I'm collecting with my eight institutions in America. When we have enough samples, I will bring in the money to study the samples, find the earliest markers, and hopefully kill cancer at the earliest stage, make cancer's first cell its last. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be with you. Bugün uh, çok ama çok özel bir konuk, çok özel bir dost, arkadaş, çok saygı duyduğum bir bilim insanı ile beraberdim. Uh, umarım uh, sizler de benim kadar bu uh, konuşmadan zevk almışsınızdır. Hepinize iyi günler diliyorum. Haftaya görüşmek üzere. <gülüyor>